everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We have a good group. Um, I'm excited. Uh, our, the name of our presentation is an anti-poverty strategy, creating financial aid opportunities for HSD, that's high school diploma, and HSE, that's high school equivalency. So students who earn a GED um, or a high set, um, adult school students using ability to benefit, otherwise known as ATB and SB 554. Our presenters today are Naomi Castro uh, from the Career Ladders Project, as well as Patty Bobko, who is the Director of Financial Aid at Chafee College. And myself, I'm Matthew Morin. I'm the Assistant Dean of Intersegmental Partnerships at Chafee College. And Laura Alvarado, who is the Assistant Director of Adult Education Pathways at Chafee College. And I have to say, even though her name is at the bottom of this list, she really is the one who has, uh, who is led this presentation and um, has, has, has gotten us all together to make sure that we are, we're on track. So big kudos to Laura for helping to shepherd us through. Next slide. So this presentation will be about uh, braiding two strategies that, uh, that, that have emerged um, in, in the last couple of years in California as uh, really effective for helping HSD and HSE students transition into credit college work. Um, and these two strategies uh, are both uh, approaches that colleges can use to provide financial aid support to students who are pursuing a high school diploma um, or a high school equivalency certificate. Uh, as well as waive fees um, for students, whether they are non-residents or residents. And uh, SB 554 is a tool that allows students to duly enroll uh, while in an adult school program for HSD, HSE, uh, and it allows the college to waive the fees for those students. And Ability to Benefit is a federal tool that allows uh, us to provide financial aid Pell uh, to those very same students. Next slide. So both of these tools fall under a kind of broad umbrella that we might wanna call dual enrollment for adult ed. And traditionally dual enrollment has been uh, almost entirely focused on uh, traditionally aged high school student minors. And um, there's been a ton of research on this. CCRC has done some really great work uh, as well as many other organizations. Recently, uh, the Wheelhouse um, study from, uh, uh, from University of California I uh, came out and has some great research about California specifically. And um, most of the research points to uh, pretty consistent findings that students who duly enroll in high school and college at the same time are more likely to graduate high school, enroll in college, college full time, maintain higher GPAs in college, persist and complete baccalaureate degrees in four to six years. And I think what's most important for our purposes in adult ed is that these positive effects are proportionally greater for students who are first gen, low socioeconomic status, um, Latinx, Black, who fall into disproportionately impacted groups with educa other educational barriers. Um, and, uh, and as you know, with adult ed, that's the space that we live in. And so the question as to why dual enrollment hasn't been a, a tool that's used widely for adults who are pursuing high school diploma or high school equivalency, I think, um, is, is one that now is getting answered, which is pretty exciting. Next slide. So one of the, uh, one of the great organizations that sort of takes that landscape of studies and uh, crunches them in a really effective way, especially looking at peer reviewed studies is the Institute for Educational Sciences. So they're one of the most reliable sources that we can look at for, um, uh, for outcomes and educational strategies. And they have uh, dual enrollment as one of their key uh, success tools um, for transition. So I just wanted to kind of uh, bring up, bring up uh, IES because uh, I think they're an important group as well when we're talking about reliability um, of research on this particular topic. Next slide. So when it comes to transition in adult uh, ed and California specifically, we really 
I think sometimes um, outside of adult ed uh, as a society underestimate the number of adults in our state who do not yet have a high school diploma. In California, it's 17%, a little over 5 million adults, um, which is, which is, you know, 4% higher than the national average. Um, and that national average of 13% is still pretty problematic. Uh, but we could really call that a crisis of educational attainment in California because um, of the size of our state, because of the size of the population of students um, who uh, or, or uh, residents who don't have uh, high school diplomas and the impact on upward social mobility and um, economic opportunity. Next slide. So how as a state do we kind of mobilize around um, really making transition from uh, high school diploma and HSC programs into credit bearing college work. Uh, in addition to, of course, like non-credit uh, CTE programs and certificate programs, which are equally as important, um, but uh, are already accessible to, uh, to students who don't have a high school diploma. I think really the, the question on the table that's been, that's provided the most barriers have been, how do we how do students who are adults who are pursuing high school diplomas be able to seamlessly and easily access college credit pathways um, with all of the restrictions and barriers and financial uh, um, challenges that, that those credit pathways uh, put in front of them? And so these two tools of ability to benefit and SB 554, uh, we're gonna review today and kind of talk about how they both can be leveraged um, to support the students uh, collectively and um, together. So we're going to start with Ability to Benefit um, and Patty Bob Bobco, the Director of Financial Aid for Chafee College, will lead the way on that discussion. Patty? Great. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm Patty Bobco, Director of Financial Aid at Chafee College. I'm so glad to be here to um, you know, sharing information on how we can continue to, to connect support programs uh, like financial aid for our students and close opportunity gaps for them. Um, this morning, I think I'll provide you some information on ATB and how we can expand financial aid through ability to benefit and eligible career pathways. So ability to benefit is a way for um, adult learners to, uh, without high school diplomas, to receive federal financial aid. And so what is ATB, right? What is ability to benefit? Ability to benefit is, a, is an alternative path that was established many years ago to increase uh, federal student aid, financial aid eligibility for students uh, without a, who do not possess a high school diploma or the equivalent. And these are the um, alternative, um, ATB alternatives in which students could become eligible for federal student aid. One of them is by passing um, an approved ability, ability to benefit test, um, such as like an AccuPlace, or, um, uh, which was used to for assessment, but with initiatives like AB705, that pretty much has, has, has been removed. So the next um, option would be for students to complete six degree applicable credits uh, towards a degree or certificate. Or, you know, students can complete a state process approved by the Secretary of State, um, state defined process. And so then students must also be enrolled in an eligible career pathway. Next slide. So here's an evolution of um, ATB. And, um, you know, with this timeline, it shows you that since the 1990s, um, it has evolved. Um, it has evolved over time, and it shows how we can continue to help students uh, without a high school diploma uh, by using ATB. So in 1991, um, students without a high school diploma were allowed to receive financial aid if they passed the ability to benefit test. Um, which require passing, it's, it's an administ admin, independently administered test. In 1992, a new option became available where um, 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 through a state defined approved process. And in 1995, the Department of Education published regulations um, uh, on a state defined process. In 2008 is when uh, the, six, the new option came through um, about taking that students could take six six degree applicable credits and become eligible for financial aid. But then in 2012, there was the elimination of, um, of ATB if a student and students who, who did not have a high school diploma and were not enrolled prior to July 1st, 2012, they would not become eligible for financial aid. And this elimination of ATB basically added 
additional inequities um, and unnecessary barriers on students who are low income students and who do not have a high school diploma and how could they advance right if they don't have the financial support in order to continue their um, education. But then in 2015, you know, this changed quickly. Um, sorry, just a little bit more. <laughs> in 2015, the provisions changed by allowing students without a high school diploma to become eligible for financial aid through a combination of the ability to benefit test and um, alternatives. But this, this once again opened the, the door for students who were enrolled um, in career pathways. So that's the key. So there is confusion. That's the confusion that it has changed for uh, so many times. And it has that has caused confusion and as a result underutilization of how ATB can still be used um, in order to for students to become eligible for financial aid. So really students can begin with the promise of eligibility by completing those six credits while they're adult learners and you know working on their high school um, on their um, working on their GED or high school diploma. After and after completing those six credits, they would become eligible uh, for financial aid. Okay, next. <clears throat> so um, really what benefits, um, what benefits do people receive, right? Federal student aid, because they, um, students would be eligible not only for federal Pell Grant, but also other types of federal aid and state aid to, to help pay for the post-secondary education of um, adult learners and living expenses as well. And so this allows for students to enroll in post-secondary education without re the requirement to first obtain a high school diploma um, and be able to, you know, by completing those credits and become eligible after. I think I'm gonna turn it to um, Naomi. Yeah, a great. Thank, <laughs> you, thank you so much, Patty. That was fantastic. And I have to say, it's just so, so nice to have uh, somebody who is so knowledgeable about financial aid, uh, really just in on this conversation. It's really exciting. Um, and often, you know, we've had some crazy experiences as practitioners uh, trying to get students um, ATB, especially in the last couple of years, because it went away. It went away for a while. So many financial aid offices across the state just think like, oh, is that even possible anymore? So it's going to um, take a real effort on all our parts to just help folks like, you know, know, like, no, 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 this is this is here, we can use it, right? And especially if we think about the pandemic, and who the most disaffected workers have been like, you know, like, who's bearing the brunt of a lot of the, the economic disparity that, um, that we've seen. So adults um, can really save a lot of time uh, with ATB. Um, I don't know about all of you on the line. Actually, if you have some stories or, you know, a couple sentences, you can drop them in on the chat, in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, I have to shut my door. You can hear my dog going crazy. <laughs> I apologize. This is the reality of our, of Zoom life. Okay, so if you have any stories, you can drop them in, in the chat too. But, um, you know, a lot of students who um, don't have a high school diploma, they're trying to continue their high school diploma, they do it, they might pick up a college class or two. Um, and uh, as we've said, we've been very clear, like unless you have that high school diploma, you are not eligible for financial aid. And what we find, uh, unless you do ATB. So what we find over and over and over again is students will try to keep up a class or two in college while they're working, while they're working on their high school equivalency or their GED. And it's just too much to juggle, right? And um, that just that little boost, that boost of a Pell Grant can really help somebody to actually stick with it and be able to finish. So um, if they have federal financial aid, students are just more likely to succeed. Um, and, and they also, they also, maintain cat uh, catalog rights, right? So what happens is they'll take a class and then they'll disenroll for one semester and then they'll go back in. But guess what? When you do that, you have new catalog rights. So um, here we go. A Pell Grant right now, we're hoping this goes up, um, but it's about um, $1,600 a semester, right? So that would be like, if you were working a job that pays a little over 12 bucks an hour, that's, that's like 134 hours in a semester. That's like one full-time day of working over a 16-week semester. So that's like, that can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. 
So let's go on um, to the next slide, please. So again, who, who qualifies? So if you are a student or if you're an individual and you do not have your high school diploma um, or an equivalency, um, and as, as Patty had said to, um, if you pass an exam, we have these exams, it's things like AccuPlace or Compass, NextGen, there's, there's a bunch of, there's a list, right? Um, but we, California community colleges have moved away from these kinds of exams. Um, other folks still do them, but, um, but we, we don't. Oh, Kathleen, catalog rights. I'm gonna take a quick segue and, and explain catalog rights. So when, you, when you're pursuing a degree or a certificate, there's the college catalog for the year you start. And that says, all the requirements you have to take a b and c and then you have this awesome certificate or this degree but those requirements change sometimes um often for cte they change more often because we want to keep up with labor market needs and what the industry says so as long as you're continuously enrolled if i started in 2000 i've got catalog rights from 2000 if the if the program changes i still get to do what the 2000 catalog said unless I stop taking classes continuously. And that's what our students do. So a certificate or a degree requirement will change. They stop taking it, uh, classes for a semester. They come back and now maybe some of the classes that they already have taken don't count anymore. That's, that's a bummer. That is such a bummer. You don't wanna be the adult or the, the college employee having those conversations with a student. It's demoralizing, right? So we want to keep them continuously enrolled if they know what their plan is. Um, and, and a Pell Grant can help to do that. So individuals who lack a high school diploma, we can have them pass an exam and say they, they earn a certain score on there, they qualify. Or if we don't have that exam set up for them or they don't want to take an exam, they can take on their own dime six credits. Um, so about two college classes and that will qualify them. They have to be in the pathway. You know, they have to, to oh, thank you, Neil, that's great. Um, they have to, uh, you know, uh, be credit bearing classes. This, this is fantastic, right? Take a couple classes. But it's kind of a bummer because they have to take those classes before we'll give them Pell Grant eligibility. Now there's other ways we can, we can help pay for that. We can help pay for it with adult dual enrollment. Um, there, a college could do an adult promise. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that they could potentially do, but a lot of that depends on our savviness as practitioners. Um, students don't know this intricate kind of web of, of potential funding. The other way that they could also be eligible is if the state itself has a defined process that's a different kind of eligibility for ATB. And uh, California doesn't have one yet, but I know that the chancellor's office is interested in this and that they've been talking about it. Um, so yeah, so, so that's something that, you know, we wanna continue working on. So let's go to the next one. So, so mostly what we're looking at is we're looking at a test, which we don't really like so much or six units, okay? Um, and uh, uh, to meet these requirements, um, the, the student um, has to, uh, uh, this is a little, a little bit redundant, but you know, they, they have to have been either to, to get financial aid federally, they, they have a degree or a GED, or they're in this eligible career pathway, right? That's what we want. We want them in a career pathway. Um, and then they have to be enrolled for the degree or certificate. They have to have a social security number. So this is only open to students who have that, um, have, uh, be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen and not be in default. Um, so yeah, so, so there we go. Let, let's go on to the next slide. Ooh, great questions. Great questions in the chat. Okay, so what makes a career pathway? Oh my gosh, we have so many definitions, right? So uh, we, we, we have local definitions. High schools often define it in a certain way. There's, we, we could cast a very wide net. Uh, but for our purposes, for ATB, we're really looking at the WIOA definition. It's aligned with the uh, HEA, it's aligned with Perkins 5, and there's seven basic elements. And so when I, when I list these elements, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of folks are just gonna nod their heads like, oh yeah, of course SARS does that. Of course it does that. So it has to be aligned with economic skills needs, uh, state level needs, regional needs. 
and has to prepare a person for a full range of educational experiences, right? So, um, so a, a wide range, right? So from an entry level position all the way to like a terminal degree in that field or a terminal certificate um, and the higher levels. Um, it has to include educational counseling and career counseling, right? Like, oh yeah, that's right, we do that. Um, uh, it has to integ uh, integrate foundational occupational education and it's organized for acceleration. Uh, one thing I know for sure is our community colleges, we are totally obsessed with trying to design things so that they're efficient and so students don't waste units. So we have certificates nested inside of larger certificates nested inside of degrees and sometimes those degrees transfer, right? And all of that is organized, that is organized in a way to accelerate students through. And here's the, here's the kicker, it enables students to attain a secondary and post-secondary credential at the same time. Um, and so that means close partnership with that adult school, close partnership with um, the, the program that is offering the, the um, high school equivalency. Um, and then, you know, it helps them advance. If we're doing all of this well, then we are helping this student to advance in, a, in, a, in an occupation. Um, and, okay, so now you might be saying, I'm, I'm reading your mind. I'm, you might be saying, hmm, okay, I'm, I've got all of this. I think our pathways do this. How do we make sure our pathways are good enough? How do we make sure they're, they're, they qualify, they're eligible? Next slide has some great news. You get to decide that your institution gets to decide that, right? So um, there's no external certification body. There's no like you know the, the the chancellor's office or the state of California or the federal government doesn't come in and say, hmm, yes, you meet one, two, and three, but you don't meet four. No, it's 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 up to us as institutions to say yes, our career pathways meet all of these requirements. This is an eligible career pathway. So that's like to me, that's like the the absolute um, best. Um, and with that, and, and oh, I see. Yeah, you guys have been, the chat's alive. Thank you all so much. But with that, I am going to um, pass it on uh, to uh, Laura. Thank you, Naomi. You always make it so clear and simple and exciting to do this work. So here we go. We're going to talk about this gap. So what's the gap? It falls in this eligibility criteria. So Naomi made a comment about how it's just too much for these students to struggle going to school, trying to work, trying to take care of families, trying to take care of themselves, um, and they're doing it on their own dime. So SB 554 is here to fill that gap. But a key word in this is partnership, echoing again what, what a word Naomi used. It's a partnership between the uh, colleges, our financial aid offices, our students, and most important, our adult schools. So uh, SB 554, this is the link. SB 554 is dual enrollment uh, legislation that was passed in October of 2019. So we're hitting, coming up, just hit our two year mark. This is basically a replica of high school dual enrollment that is now applicable in an equity measure to our high school students who are also adults. So what does this do? SB 554 uh, authorizes a student who's enrolled in their high school diploma or equivalency program to uh, be determined as a special part-time admit in a community college. So this term special part-time admit is what allows the colleges to process these students through as dual enrollment and provide funding and resources. So what, is, what does it mean to be a special part-time admit? Well, here's some key things. Uh, as a special part-time, part-time being the key word here, a student can take up to 11 units for either zero or very minimal costs. So the $46 a unit, that piece is waived, but any residual college fees, that's a, a local decision if uh, those can be waived. So here at our college, solely for purposes of equity and access, we have waived all of those fees. Additionally, we use CAPE funding um, and other grants to cover the books for these students. So an adult school student 
in our district who is attending Chafee College pays zero fees. Back to that partnership piece, um, we need to confirm that these students are in fact enrolled in the adult school. So we work very closely with the adult school on servicing these students and receiving that eligibility, or excuse me, verification. Um, but that partnership also expands to counseling for the students, to making sure that the students are taking the classes that they need, perhaps for their HSD or prepping for the GED, or simply if they're looking at some CTE or uh, focusing on their defined career pathway. So we have our Chafee College counselors available as well. On the college side, there's a benefit to this of serving our students is that we receive enhanced apportionment. So this is about a third higher base than, um, we get about a third higher than the base of traditional credit students. These units that are earned, this is where those six units can come in. Students can take, can be duly enrolled through an adult school and a college, receive those six units, not on their own dime. And now it moves them into that eligibility for ATV. There's another little piece here that I saw in the chat they were talking about is what about our undocumented students? Well, this is one of the key pieces of this legislation of SB 554. And while it doesn't meet the needs here because our ATB students do need to be US citizens or eligible non-residents. An undocumented student is eligible to become a special part-time admin if they are duly enrolled in their adult school and with the community college. So this pathway, how is this going to work? So a student enrolled in the adult school, we partner with them. We provide counseling services. We provide career services. Uh, we provide tutoring. We can provide uh, additional resources like food pantry, honors programs, CalWORKs, different mechanisms that that student now has access to at the college. So we're partnering with the adult school and transitioning them while they're duly enrolled from the adult school into the college. As Matt said earlier, they're more likely to complete their high school diploma. They're more likely to complete their GED. They're more likely to receive and to, to move through the systems and transition to community college. And because of the uh, organization of our certificates and degrees, as Naomi, Naomi spoke of, that student can build upon that college pathway. They can build upon their goals. They can go into the workforce because maybe they've earned some certificates in welding. They've earned an HVAC. They're moving into electricity, logistics, um, English, whatever it is that's going to move them down that pathway. Free tuition. They meet that eligibility for ATB. So now they're receiving about, if they're going part-time with an adult enrollment, about $3,600 a year. When we transition them to become a full-time student, so now they have received that high school diploma or the equivalency, they can be earning about $6,500 a year using ATB. Again, and now they're, they're supported with all these additional college services. So this is that link, the link between the adult school to the college to ATB that ties it all together to move that student, that individual, that family into not only a living wage, but into a thriving wage. And that is it. Are there any questions that we can answer here in the chat? You can also unmute if somebody would like to. You're welcome to unmute yourself if you have questions for us. I have a question. I'll just unmute myself because not able to type this morning. Um, so there was just a webinar presentation um, just earlier that ended um, at, at 10.30 or 10 um, around dual enrollment and board policies that have to be um, presented to at the community college on the community college side. Is ATB, um, is, does there have to be a board policy at the college to enact this 
or is it simply a financial, is it simply within the realm of the financial aid office? So what are, what would be some beginning steps that you would recommend to, to, to begin this? You want me to answer that or Patty, would you like to jump in there? Sure, we could do it together. <laughs> uh, so we are actually working um, on, you know, creating a board policy because it's necessary since it's something that it really, uh, it's an institutional policy. We want to have something, you know, like uh, Naomi mentioned, the Department of Education doesn't say, you know, we're going to approve you. It's something that we want to make sure that we have it as procedures, that this is what we're going to be following um, to back us up, you know, to, to justify, validate, you know, that procedure. And when we did our, our uh, recently we worked back to this partnership, uh, our authors worked very closely with Patty. She's gracious, gracious enough to allow us to come in and offer any guidance that we can. So we created a very brief board policy. I think if we, all, we just basically added ATB into the language, but then it was going into Patty and the financial aid policies where we really detailed how this would work and the uh, career pathway requirements. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on that, if you want to think about it in two ways, just just from our our sort of drilling down, it might save you guys some time. Um, the policy piece, we kept a really broad, just basically um, uh, indicator that we are a an ability to benefit um, eligible college, and we have an ability to benefit uh, process. And then, so that that's at the board policy level, and then at the process level for uh, the Office of Financial Aid's internal process documents. That's where we got into the weeds of like what constitutes a career pathway, how students are chosen for that, um, so that so that the board policy can kind of still sit at a very broad level um, and and pivot with whatever changes might occur with federal legislation over time, but that the internal process documents for financial aid that auditors would also look at, um, we're still doing our due diligence and that's kind of writ, you know, written out uh, prescriptively and, and uh, with more specificity. Yeah, and I think to add to what Laura said, you know, I had my policy already, my policies and procedures, and just reviewing the current policy, removing some of maybe older language that we had, and then just adding this piece so that it creates, um, I don't know, more of a clear picture of how to operationalize it. <clears throat> and just to be clear, I don't know if it was really, uh, we, we haven't identified any community college that is actively using a career pathway in our investigation and research with Career Ladders Project and others. So if you know of any community college that is doing a career pathway oriented ATB, um, that would be great. Let us know. We want to kind of partner and, um, and lift this up because I think it's been, a, it's been a resource that's underutilized because there's been a lot of fear and confusion about those career pathways and how to move forward as a college. But once you dip your toe in the water, it actually is a lot, uh, it's a lot more warm, it's warmer than you might think. It's not really that, I don't know about this analogy, but anyway. Matt, it's Yulene Olinger, Mendocino Lake. Um, I have a question on just really, you know, starting that conversation at our college uh, in providing and creating policies and you know, steps and guidelines from the SB 554, then to ATB, just like how you outlined the connection there, right? So how did you guys kind of begin that conversation? I know we're both, um, you know, at the community college, and then I know that the adult school, you know, they're all for this. And yet, you know, I think for us, we're really lagging behind in that uh, we don't know how to start this, this you know, conversation. Uh, with their admissions and records or, you know, how did you guys start with that? Um, you know, I think any of us could, we've all been pretty active. I'll just say my part, start with knocking on a door, start with a phone call that really is, you know, the best way to just get started is just to kind of build that personal relationship setting, making sure that 
it's uh, that there's some meetings that are really like uh, maybe not face to face, but maybe in Zoom face to face, um, so that you begin to know the all of the partners. Laura, I, I feel like you probably have Laura and Patty. Both of you guys probably have a lot of insight into this. All right, and if I can clarify, are you referring to the the using SB five five four towards ATB or starting the SB five five four conversation? I think both. You know, so if the SB five five four. You know, if mm -hmm. that's where it should start, because we're at the community college and we do have, um, you know, partnership with our adult schools, maybe start with that and then later on. But knowing that there's ATB as well. Right. So I don't know if even our admissions and record knows this, um, you know, Senate bill and this, um, you know, bill has been passed and it's been, you know, for a few years that it's it's been there and not implemented. So that SB 554 conversation can be a little bit difficult because the, the first question is, well, why not use the promise, Cal Promise, fog waiver? Let's use that. How this conversation got started at Chafee is we ran some co-located adult school, excuse me, college classes on our adult school campus. And we attempted to use the bog, at the time then bog waiver. Um, I think it was still got that then. And we found a lot of resistance. Um, we had a pilot group of 51 students and only 35% were willing to complete the BOG waiver for a variety of reasons. And we had a few undocumented students in there, but just a, a small handful. Uh, many of them, it was, it was intimidating. Uh, they weren't comfortable filling out FAFSA, particularly because they were aware they didn't have the HSD, HSC and assumed that they could not receive it. We had mixed uh, status families. So they, while they themselves were eligible as a US citizen, they may have uh, recent relatives or close relatives that were not. So that was a little bit threatening to them and a variety of other reasons. So that's where we really started that conversation when we saw in our data what the, the assumed uh, resources, they weren't accessible to the student for, for a variety of barriers. Um, and then that's really where Matt took it and started planning for the SB 554 because we have this tool, this resource that we're using for high school students. And this, in fact, our adult school students are high school students. The main difference is the age. The, the why is very different. It's, there's a more of a, opinion here, more of a moral imperative to serve our adult school students and move them and provide these tools for them. Uh, because it has an immediate effect on themselves and their families, just a very different why. So I think part of it is, is really trying to pin down what that why is for yourself uh, uh, and to be able to articulate that and then moving in with those conversations, because otherwise it might just be that presumptive use, use Cal Promise. Thank I hope you that all. answers your question. It, it helps to, to think through, it's like, so why are we going to use SB 554? Why not Cal Promise, you know? And so that, and also it helps to kind of define, you know, in the community college, I think when we think of dual enrollment, we think of, you know, the 17 year old, the 16 year old mm -hmm. that is dual enrolled, what we call middle college here in our area. But mm -hmm. not a lot of our college colleagues really know that there is dual enrollment Moment, and that is called the SB 554 for adult learners. And I think that's, you know, that's an education, like, you know, to, um, to get the word out there and to begin that conversation of like, this is what we're talking about. So thank you. And there, there is a triangulation here. It's really building, uh, think of the, the student and the adult school in the center, but it's the college working, your particular office working close with admissions and then already starting to build that bridge with financial aid, because those are the key resources that will be needed uh, to, to build this, to take it all the way through from where you are now to that uh, ATB eligibility and funding for the student. I think for me, I'll take my example, just so Matt and Laura just approach me. And I know it's, you know, there's still confusion about ATB, but I think it's just at least for me, you know, it just kind of took some time to acknowledge and say, wow, you know, we've been using you know, just this timeline, the way we've been using it. And so just kind of help me dig a little deeper on our 
on on the actual regulation and what we can and cannot do. And I think just building those uh, just that partnership and conversations. I know how it can be with financial aid because we're we're so highly regulated, right? Mm -hmm. But if we have the information and 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 uh, that can validate for you know to to open this, you know, and be make, make this a a, a policy um, and access to to um, our students, then then why not, right? So I think it's just for me. My example is just that they just knocked on my door and just you know talked about it and just helped me get more information and 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 how we can make this happen. I'd actually like to add in. So I I, I think everyone's going to get a copy of these slides, but I think that one slide in particular that showed like the like it was like the timeline, but the timeline's not straight, you know, and there's, uh, there's lots of detail on there, but that printing that out. And if you are in person or if you're not sending a PDF um, to, the, to the folks in your financial aid office, the financial aid director and saying, whoa, check this out. Like, do we still use ATB? Did we used to? Uh, it, it would, you know, really help students if we could kind of get that going again. And that's an assumption that it's, it's stopped. Maybe it is going steady, um, but maybe, you know, you have an opportunity to scale it or, you know, so I, I even think that that graphic would be an excellent way to start that conversation because it's like, just, you know, this is a learning process and, and there was a lot of confusion over this. Let's work together and, and try and roll it out so students can benefit. Um, there was a question in the chat from, from Neil about SB 68 and AB 540, which I think is, is somewhat important to address because there have been questions about, well, you know, what about students who are non-residents or undocumented and, um, and about the fact that ATB is not uh, an eligible uh, program for them to uh, enroll in, um, but SB 554 is. Uh, for waiving tuition for non-residents and undocumented students, there becomes a point at which a student completes their high school diploma or high school equivalency with an adult school, and then they get bumped into a different first-time college student enrollment status at the college. And if they are undocumented, um, there's, there are a number of barriers uh, for obtaining um, uh, financial aid at the community college. And the there's a whole host of pathways that colleges can use to kind of hack that and open up doors for undocumented students. One of which is uh, AB 540 and then an affiliated uh, piece of legislation, SB 68. Um, uh, but if we're honest, those, those two pieces, those two pathways still present enormous challenges mm -hmm. to most undocumented students um, or potential students. And so, uh, there are a number of working groups right now in the state for working on trying to reform those pieces of legislation to open the gates wider so that they're eligible to students um, who have not only completed, uh, you know, two plus years in the high school or 420 hours times three at an adult school, you know, there's, there's, a, we won't get into the details of SB 68 and, and AB 540, but um, uh, hopefully we can in this next legislative cycle or the next one after that, um, make it so that those two pathways are a lot more accessible for undocumented students, because it's true. If they enroll in SB 554 and they're making progress towards degree in a credit pathway. And then all of a sudden they hit the wall of AB 540 or SB 68, um, which won't let them in and continue their progress towards degree. Then that's, that's a, that's a huge uh, problem because we're setting them up for failure on the front end. I guess I'm curious to hear from the practitioners on the line, like, can you think of examples? Can you think of specific students? You don't have to share their names, but if, can you think of specific students who you might work with right now that this might be helpful for them? Either 
adult dual enrollment or ATB or a combination. I know there's some people in here who I know personally who are working on this, but I don't want to call them out. We can see your names. We can call. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> Hi, this is Uto from San Diego East Region and Data Education. We we are we implemented SB 554 um, also successfully because of many conversations with you in Chaffee College, uh, especially Matt. And um, so it's it works for, we have students now in SP 554 who tell us straightforwardly, I would never have joined college. I would never have even attended high school diploma programs at the adult school had it not for, been for this program. This allowed me to check out college, accomplish in a really accelerated manner some goals I always had, but now I know what it's for. Now I can go into, a, into an occupation faster. Now I know who I am as a person. So, so the growth, the personal growth that comes about because of SP 554 is truly amazing. And it also encourages ESL students to get, get out of their ESL programs and into, in a way, experiencing college without so much at stake. So for those who are slightly on the fence, SP 554 is, is beautiful. Um, and yeah, and then we have some undocumented for someone with who doesn't have resident status yet, uh, for to whom it's also beneficial. Uh, so I, it works. It works really well. It 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 draws in students we would never have seen otherwise in adult education. If I can share, my name is Maria Lopez. I am a transitions counselor for San Bernardino Valley College, and I work with um, um, mostly three of the adult schools in our region. We have five total. Um, and SB 554 is something that we are about to start implementing in the spring. Um, and I'm super excited about it because um, for those who are completing high school diploma this academic year and are enrolling in SB 554, they are technically not starting their financial aid um, clock, if you will, um, because uh, SB 554 is paying for their units. Not only that, we're offering courses that will help them. Uh, it's a guidance course. We call them student development courses. So those courses will help them, in essence, figure out what career path they want to begin with, um, which kind of helps them sort out, you know, um, what kind of things they can do in college and learn uh, really the, the college experience. Um, yeah, that's actually a great place to start. Like if you want to think about what next, you know, after those students complete, because you talked about their clock, um, uh, after they complete six units, um, maybe through those like career development courses um, for the students who uh, who are Hell eligible, um, you could offer them if if your college uh, creates that ATB pathway, that would be an opportunity for you to offer them, you know, that additional uh, Pell funding to help support their total cost of education as well. So that's exciting. And Ute, I need to give you a shout out because uh, she was immensely uh, helpful in actually. Um, making sure that SB 554 came into fruition because we we ran into, uh, there were a lot of political uh, um, uh, potholes along the way. Mm -hmm. And um, and there were various points at which um, practitioners and uh, uh, advocates sort of lobbied and stepped in and she was one of one a really helpful, got, got together a lot of people to really help out when some things happened, so. <laughs> Thank you. And I definitely, I will be going to my financial aid office next week talking about ATB. <laughs> I bet they know you well. Now. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I, 
think <clears throat> I think I would ask as as you reflect on this and think, okay, ATV is the end goal. Who or who in your in your college can be those advocates for you? You know, is it your high school dual enrollment office? Is it your adult ed office? Your uh, admissions officers, counselors, directors, and then who above them is going to come in and really be that champion for you? Uh, that's I think back to the original question: is how did we get started, or, or how do where do you, where do you start? It's finding those 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 key folks that are willing to go in and say yes, absolutely. Because in building this process, it, it's going to involve, um, it, it takes a village. It definitely takes a village. But having those key folks in your in the adult ed office um, and, and maybe even going and learning a lot, learning more about how dual enrollment works on the high school side and somewhat partnering with them. So I would, I would ask everybody if you're interested in this um, and using SB 554, start with who can you identify? Who can you identify as some of those go-to people? Um, and how would you start that conversation? Or what do you need? What data do you need from your school to start that conversation? So Annabelle, you asked, uh, what does the financial aid office have to do on their end to implement this? So on the SB 554 side, it really is the admissions office, um, but bringing in financial aid at some point, uh, making sure that they knew like, you know, having Patty on to let her know what we were doing and knowing that when we're moving into that AB, uh, uh, ATB space, that she has a clear understanding already of what of what and how uh, SB 554 works, particularly because of the waiving of the fees. They're not using financial aid in the traditional sense uh, under SB 554. So it's just, it's, it's making all the key players just know what's happening. But on that onset of SB 554, it is all admissions. Something that we found um, valuable in financial aid because financial aid offices uh, have a point, have point people um, mm -hmm. to work with students on uh, AB 540 um, and SB 68, or even like the six unit waiver for undocumented students, any of those programs that live in financial aid that have staff uh, members, classified staff members who work with the students who enter into those programs, it's really valuable for them to know about SB 554 because um, uh, because of the fact that even though SB 554 is not a financial aid program, those individuals are meeting with students who sometimes they have to turn away because they're not eligible for AB 540 or SB 68. And they, if, and if they don't know about SB 554, then that's an opportunity that, that, that might be missed. Patty, can you share what information would be needed to move into that ATB space? Uh, what do you need on what do you need uh, on your on the financial aid side and what data might they need from uh, the adult side partners? I'm probably what I'm thinking is um, you know students who already applied for financial aid. Um, well, on one side, I think you know we have students who apply for financial aid and do not have a high school diploma or equivalent. I think it's also helpful to see what those numbers look like because those are some of our outreach that we could do to um, promote SB 50, you know, 554 to be able to, to help put this together. But um, I mean, I, I, um, I, I hope, is that what you're asking? I'm sorry. Annabelle? Can you, do you want to unmute yourself and, and yeah, thanks. I, wasn't, clarity? I wasn't sure if you were uh, referring to my question. So, so on the, oh, sorry. I was talking while I was muted. 
<laughs> um, so on the financial aid side, for as far as ATB, mm -hmm. what do they have to do to, to enact this, to implement this? Um, and how can adult ed partners make it easier? Like I have this wonderful PowerPoint. That's great. From a financial aid perspective, what else might you need from me um, to move this along? And what does that actually look like at the financial aid um, office? Do they have to get approval? D does, does the college have say so whether they, they approve ATB or not? Or is this just part of an educational right that a college has that a school has to implement? I know that was multiple questions. I hope that made sense. Oh, that's okay. I think uh, Matt and Laura were still trying to kind of, you know, figure out what would that look like for us and, you know, and how to operationalize this. Currently, we have students who apply for financial aid and do not have high school diplomas. So that's a good way to find, um, a good way to, for us to know is typically we ask students to, uh, we reach out to students or students reach out to us to, um, you know, I don't have a high school diploma. And so this is the opportunity that we can offer, right? But um, I think that typically having someone assigned to um, who would be, you know, um, having that connection between um, our adult ed program and financial aid is always very helpful to be able to kind of, you know, having someone um, a, like a point person to be able to, to have these connections and be able to to, to work through this. That's kind of, we're still working through that process. Um, right now, if a student, let's say, has completed six degree applicable credits, let's just say, for example, that meets that criteria because they were enrolled in a program prior to July 1st, 2012, we reach out to counseling and we have, we have a student who has indicated that they completed the six degree applicable, uh, applicable credits. So then they let us know if they apply and then we move forward. So in kind of the same way, we kind of picture that it, it may, we may operationalize this, that you know, having that point person to be able to make sure that we are connected and, 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 and creating that process. I hope that helped. Um, if, <laughs> um, we're still working through through the processes with Matt and Laura and how we would, he would, we would do this. Yeah, and I think maybe one of the helpful things is uh, we're, we're pretty much done with our uh, board policy language and the, um, uh, and the, the process, um, uh, the process um, walk, walk through guidance in, uh, in financial aid. So I think, uh, I think, you know, if you wanted to reach out, we could, we could share that with you. And I think that's the best way to be able to address your financial aid mm -hmm. director is to say, you know, this is what Chafee put together. How does this look to you? And then also your director can reach out to Patty um, yes. because they, they all have uh, a network that, um, that they can kind of lean on each other for. So. Yeah, that's really awesome, actually, Patty, having that the, your counterpart at other colleges. And so is it OK if if you share copies of both your ATB policy and your dual adult dual enrollment? And I can reach I can happy to reach out to um, you, Matt or, or um, Laura for that. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get it together in a in a format that we can kind of like provide to you guys and then um, and and uh, yeah, feel free to, to shoot uh, Laura. I don't know if our contact information is in the chat. It but, is the, our emails at the very end, but um, we can- it's on, the slide. It it's on the slide deck also. Yes. Yeah. Right on. So- And just to add, you know, I think that, you know, having a, a, a policy procedure already on ATB on, on kind of the old way, bringing, bringing this new, um, or not new, but <laughs> unused piece <laughs> that we want to implement, right? It's just kind of an additional, oh, okay, here's another way that we can continue with our process, right? And so I think that's where, um, where it becomes, um, it became easier for me having a policy already uh, to just incorporate this, this part right here and how we can partnership and keep that part, partnership with adult program. Yeah, and full disclosure, a lot of uh, financial aid, regional consortia or meetings, you know, we've, we've learned from Patty, you know, there's still a kind of perception that ATB career pathways aren't really an eligible uh, program to implement for colleges. So it is likely that you, your financial aid director may say like, 
sorry, that's like not really um, allowable. Um, and I think that's where the conversation with Patty comes in uh, because yeah, we've really, we've cleared this, we've cleared the way, not just at our college, but you know, with partners like CLP, um, Naomi, uh, and, then, and then our national partners like CLASP and World Ed, uh, we've been to Washington DC and talked to the folks uh, in the federal Pell uh, offices down there. So like, we're really, we're really allowed to do it for real. <laughs> I like what Naomi said about uh, the, the, the timeline, because when I saw that timeline, it's probably my first, um, I was a bit shocked, right? Because I just, you know, I, all along I knew about the 2012, that's what my policy said, and that's what we were following. I remember about 2015, but again, it, it didn't seem like it applied to, to our colleges. And, you know, I think speaking as a, as a network, it, it didn't seem like that would align with what we, you know, our community colleges. And I think that just having, uh, going through that career path um, programs and, and the seven elements really helped me when I talked to Matt and Laura, just really make it um, as a, um, just thinking of, wow, that's just, that's the approach that it is ATB, there's no doubt about it, right? And so it makes it, the more I learned, the more I read about it, I think that it helped me to feel more at ease that this is true, this is okay, right? We, it's permissible. And so we just have to figure out how. Patty, I'm gonna jump in real quick here. Um, Naomi Castro from Career Ladders Project, I know she needs to sign off. Naomi is a, a leader amongst leaders particularly on these topics that um, move students forward, which is the goal for all of us. So thank you, Naomi, for joining us today and for offering your brilliance and sharing it with us. So um, thank you. And if anybody has any other follow-up questions for Naomi, her information is also on that slide, but we'll be able to continue our conversation here for a few more minutes. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate all the work that you are all doing. Thank you so much and uh, all, all love to Chafee College, groundbreaking work you guys are doing. Right, thanks. Thank you, Naomi. I also want to open the door to anybody else who wants to uh, leave. We, we've, we've given you back some time in your life to go get lunch. And, um, and uh, if you do have questions, you know, feel free to ask. But uh, you know, for our purposes, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I do want to address Kathleen had a question in here. And so she's asking if she's an adult school student, and wants to come to a community college and, and use SB 554, how, did, how, does she do, how would she do that? What documentation? So uh, this is an internal process that would need to be built first. Um, to give you an example of how Chafee does it, we have on the back end, we have it connected. So when a student, when they complete uh, CCC apply and they choose their enrollment status, they choose uh, adult school, enroll, adults, enrolling in adult school authorized to attend college. So we have it triggered now that when a student selects that, they are moved into basically a holding place. So uh, that from there will trigger all their fees to be waived. And we do it electronic enrollment forms. So we have the classes that they can take on a form or they can apply through admissions. It's all automated on our side. So uh, Kathleen, that's a, it's an undertaking. So if anybody is interested on that processes part, I can send you information. You can contact me. Um, it's, it's a, again, as I said earlier, it takes a village. It also takes a village on the internal piece to build that all the way to connecting it to the MIS code. So that's something absolutely, please feel free to contact me and I can share that with you. All right, I can leave the room open a little bit for questions if anyone wants to hang around. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and do my closing remarks, if that's okay. Um, I put the evaluation link in the chat, so please make sure you fill that out. Um, as a reminder, all the resources that were shared throughout today's conference can be found under the resource section of the VFAIRS platform landing page. 
you're welcome to add um, all of those resources to your swag bag or email them to a colleague. Um, this session was recorded, so you'll be able to access this recording and all other sessions on the VFairs platform uh, through the end of the year once those are posted. Um, you can like, locate those in the agenda. There will be a button uh, called re uh, labeled recording. Uh, remediated recordings will be added to the Cal Adult Ed website in the new year, and all registrants will be notified by email and via the newsletter. Okay, so with that, um, like I said, I'll just stop the recording. If there's any questions, I don't know if the presenters want to hang out or if you just wanted me to close the room out. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, though. Thanks, everybody, for coming. The next sessions, I believe, start at 1 o'clock. So have a great lunch. Thank you, Marjorie, for your help. Thank you, Marjorie.